Okay, so I deleted some videos. I had uploaded one, the first one in the series of videos that I was making a biface and a finish point out of the material that I was napping, the uh, landscape stone that I was napping. In the landscaping stone video, I deleted that series of videos. It was a two hour long series, which means there's four videos. Yep, I deleted the whole batch because I was going in a direction that I didn't want to go in. I didn't realize that I was not explaining the process properly because I had missed I missed something major. I didn't realize that some people watching that series uh, don't know what napping is at all. And they're asking me, what, what are you making? What is it? Yeah, we know, we see the la 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 technique, but what are you making? What, what is it? And uh, show us, you know, the whole process, please. Because we have no idea what you're making. That didn't occur to me that that was one of the reasons why people wanted me to post the entire process. Uh, as a napper, I just take it for granted that, you know, everybody knows, everyone that's watching the channel knows that I am making bifaces and preforms and things like that for future use. It will become an arrowhead or a knife blade or a spear point or an that little dart point or whatever. You know, I take it for granted that people already know that, but they don't know that in many cases. Now, I napped the other one. Let's see, I had this one, this biface that I used the la 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 technique on. And this is the other one. I had a two hour long video series on napping this one. Now, I know a lot of you guys probably wanted to see that. This is the easier biface, right? This was the easier biface, but um, as I was napping it, I was being overly careful with it, and I think what I was doing was catering to the video format for this one. I don't want to do that. I don't want to make points based on what's safe to make on video. I've been doing that a lot and I don't want to do that. I want to just make the points the way I make them and not worry too much about what I can do to preserve the point on video because I've done that many times. You know, I say I'm just going to leave it this way for the video. I'm napping it this way for the video, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't really matter too much, but it matters to me. Uh, I, may, I might just make adjustments to this one on video. Well, to make a long story even longer, I'm going to nap everything that I do. Everything, everything, everything film everything that I do. Did I say nap everything? I'm going to film everything that I nap, film everything that I do, put everything on video. If I don't have much for the auction, so be it. Because it takes me twice as long to nap on video as it does to nap off camera. Twice as long at a minimum. Uh, I'm not counting the time that it takes to prepare for the videos. Not just taping the gloves, for example, or taping or uh, sharpening the tools and stuff. But I'm, I'm not counting that. I'm counting, you know, setups and takedowns. I have to set up and take down all my stuff daily. I don't have a, a specific dedicated shop. Anyway, when am I going to start napping? It's already 4 minutes and 45 seconds. Well, we're, we've already cleared out the people who are not really interested in napping. They don't really watch past 4 minutes. And uh, even if they're into napping, they don't watch past six minutes. 
if they forgot to change the channel, they'll watch for eight minutes. Most of them. So you got rid of most of the ones that clicked on this by accident. So I'll start napping here in a minute. I'm not going to lie to you. This particular one is going to be very difficult. It's going to be a pain in the butt. Right? I do nap these at nappings, and I don't have much success napping these. And I said I don't want to nap it for the video, you know, take steps to preserve it for the video. But I'm going to have to with this one. But on the most of my stuff that I'm going to be napping, I don't want to have to adjust my technique to make sure I don't break it on video. I'm also going to start taking notes and have a note, uh, my notes prepared for the videos ahead of time. Okay? So I don't get sidetracked. All right, so I already mentioned that I deleted the whole series. And there are many, many reasons why you would want to see the whole series. Uh, the, the, the basic one that I missed was that people actually don't know what this is. What is it? It's a, depending on what it's going to be used for, it's either a core or a biface. A core is when you strike flakes off and you use the flakes. And uh, this is not used other than to obtain flakes from. You obtain flakes from this, it's called a core, because you're using the flakes, you're not using this. Uh, but if you're going to use this as the basis for a tool, then this is a biface. And but in this case, it's a biface. Even though I reduced it with the la 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 technique, this is a biface that I'm going to use for something that the la 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 people didn't use. This is going to be like an archaic North American Indian projectile point when I finish. Probably Texas, because this is Texas chert. Probably a point that was utilized by Texas Indians in the past. It has nothing to do with the la la la. All right? Now, you're going to say the uh, naps really nicely. There's always Mr. Nicely in, in the audience. It naps really nicely, right? But uh, as I have stated before, if I were to hand this to you, you would not be able to get good flakes off of it because it's a pain in the butt to flake. And uh, I'm just taking big, large flakes to flatten it right now if I can. But as it gets thinner, it's going to be increasingly more difficult to do this kind of thing. Okay? Increasingly more and more difficult. So yeah, I'm going to start filming everything. Everything, everything. Okay. See with the uh, with this kind of material, that's pretty common. Stiff fractures everywhere. I flattened this out before I started. You know, I, I ground that down. It's part of the tool maintenance on this particular type of tool. Not only does it have to be flat, but it has to be smooth, relatively speaking. I go around and I use it as a little bit of an abrader, and I, I'll brush the edges to remove some delicate areas. Rather than having to put this down and bring up the abrader, I will abrade the edges with this. When it starts getting pitted, it works even better. Right now it's kind of smooth, so it's not working that great. Now I goof around on the videos. I think I'll still continue to goof around, but I'm going to try to take a little bit of a step back and realize that some people have no idea what's going on. 
So if I want them to subscribe, which I do, I'm going to need to step way back from the process and, and uh, be Captain Obvious to a lot of you guys. But, oh well. Yeah. Okay. I'll goof around a little bit just to keep it interesting. Okay. But yeah, I'm in the process of thinning. Yeah, and even though that's not going past halfway, like comparatively speaking, that should go past halfway, past the center from the impact point, but you don't have to do it on the ends that way. That's mainly pertaining to the sides, okay? Go past halfway from the sides. Some people don't realize I'm talking about going past halfway from the sides, not from the ends. Yeah, that should have been a lot better. How am I going to take that turtle back off? You'll see. You'll see. It takes some time. Sometimes it takes a while to get into a position where you can thin it down like you want to. We'll see. It's very dangerous. To, I'm going to have to hit it extremely hard. But the, the platform here is isolated somewhat. So it sticks out, so it's kind of a no-brainer. It doesn't have to be very accurate. I can just smack it with not so much accuracy, which is good because I'm going to wind up. I've even changed the position of my lamp, my lamps, yeah, from being on this side to that side. Although it's a little bit uncomfortable, I like to have my left foot out here. My right foot's usually back because of the holding of the indirect percussion flaker, and I can put the stand there. But I put the stand there and my left foot gets uncomfortable. But anyway, I'll adjust. Okay, here we go. And it also, the angle, that angle prevents me from seeing certain things, but oh well. Now I always ask, did it do it? Did it do it? I'm hoping it did it, All right? It did it somewhat. See, it did take down some of that turtle back. And Mr. Nicely says, I still think it naps not really nicely. I, st that's, I still think that. Yeah, it looks like it's napping really nicely. Yeah, it's a, I'm sweating right now because every strike could break the piece and in the video that I deleted I mentioned the fact that even though you watch these videos these flit napping videos over and over mine and other people's there are some things that you'll never pick up from the video even if you watch the entire process from start to finish there are things you'll never pick up from the video what are those things that you'll never pick up from the video? One of them is, which flakes are lucky? You'll never pick up, no matter how many times you watch the video, which flakes are luck, just plain dumb luck. And me as a napper, sometimes I don't know which ones are just plain dumb luck or just a matter of skill only. When you look at some pressure flakes that are like parallel, um, that's not luck, that's skill. Parallel flaking, the flake over grind guys type of stuff. That's skill. Me eliminating a turtle back without snapping the whole thing in half, there's a high percentage of luck involved. Like I'm gonna hit this extremely hard. There's some luck involved in removing this lump because uh, the platform is not perfect. Or the edge, I should say. That's another thing. 
You'll never pick up what is a correct platform from looking at the video. Because platform, uh, the concept of the platform is derived after the fact. You look at a flake and you go, okay, this is where the platform is. It's after the fact. The flake and the platform are after the fact. Uh, where's the platform on here and what characteristics make the platform? You, you won't pick that up from here until after the fact, after I remove a flake. You just have to basically kind of blindly go with the averages in your skill and just make this edge look like what will work. There's no set definition for a platform before the fact. I know that doesn't make sense, but the platform is defined after the fact. Okay, just like the flake. Where's the flake here? There's no flake, although you can imagine one. There's no flake here. The flake is after the fact. Just like the, there's no platform here, really. It's just an edge that's been contoured uh, in a way that is more conducive to flaking. There's no platform yet. And we get confused. We confuse people. They don't understand what platforms are. They're looking at the edge of the the uh, the workpiece, and they just don't understand it. They don't get what platforms are. And it's because there is no real set definition for platform before the fact. Just like they don't really know where the flake's going to be here. They don't really know what the flat platform should look like, and it's. It's a problem. Especially when you're doing the, the la 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 technique. The platform, if you look at it before the fact, it looks huge. You're using a previous flake scar as a platform. But where, where is it on that big huge area? Could be anywhere along the edge. If this was a smooth flake removal here, that platform could be anywhere. Anywhere, Every, everywhere is a potential hit spot. You don't see the platform until after you remove the flake. And then you look at the flake and that's where the platform is according to the archeologists, okay? As, as a flit napper, I will call this a continuous platform even though I isolate some areas more than others. Sometimes randomly, sometimes not randomly. I try just I just try to make this edge as conducive as possible for a potential flake. And it involves a certain angle. You, you can do that. But it's supposed to be nice and smooth. See how this is all kind of steppy and cruddy? Well, it doesn't really matter to me too much. I'm just going to take the risk and hit it anyway. I can't be spending all this time trying to make these things perfect. I goof around and I say, I'm going to make doo-doo with what I got. But that's exactly what I'm doing. I'll just make doo-doo with what I got uh, for the sake of expediency. Now, if I wanted to be extremely precise, I would do flake over grind. I wouldn't mess with this kind of random stuff. I would grind this whole thing into a perfect lenticular shape with a nice, strong edge all the way around and then nap it. Then start to to remove flakes and then I can discuss the exact angles and show you exactly what a, a conducive edge looks like for the production of flakes but I don't I'm not grinding this smooth and working it that way I hope that's clear clear as mud okay yeah you just want to see me reduce it to see if I can actually do it a lot of people, that's what they want to see. Can I actually do it from what I started with? Because they, they don't want to know anything else except I want to see the whole process because partial process to me is out of context. They want to see the entire context because anything out of context gets ejected. They push the eject button, they're out of, they're out of there. All right, so I'm going to try to give you, con give you some context. All right. So I hit in a general area, right there. I don't. I did not know where it was going to hit. I did not know it was going to break this way. 
Okay. There's more than one area where it, it shattered. It's a large area. It's not one specific spot. And I don't know exactly where it hit, although I think it was in the middle. And it just kind of shattered and uh, shattered the platform a little bit. Okay. But let's see if it worked. You look, and the platform is here. You can trace it according to the bulb of percussion. The bulb of percussion is right there. So that was the platform right here, not in the middle. I assumed it was the middle, but it's not. It's right there. And when I assume it's in the middle, that means the next time I strike, I'm thinking that this was the good area, but it, it wasn't. It's right there. So. I would need to examine each and every flake very, very carefully to see where the platform ended up being. And then after hundreds of strikes, I averaged them out and I would say, uh, according to the way I held it, I tend to hit to this side. And then I can try to analyze it very persnickety that way. And uh, it might help me in my overall napping but to approach it in that way, I think takes longer to learn because some of the stuff is luck. And you don't, you'll never pick up which one is luck. And I have a hard time figuring out which one is luck and which one is skill. So eventually, we're going to have to figure out a way to teach people what a platform is before the fact. I tend to create a large area and not isolate, although it's advantageous to isolate a little bit because you, when you're hitting with a large area and fast and hard, it's difficult to control the flaker right? for accuracy. So you need to isolate just so that it's, it becomes kind of a no-brainer. If it hits there, it's okay. If it hits like that, it's okay. If it hits a little bit low, it's okay. If it hits a little bit high, it's okay. It just it, it, uh, helps to increase your accuracy by isolating the platform. But I don't consider or I don't think about exactly where is the spot I'm going to hit. And I don't isolate a very exact spot. I'm just depending a lot on luck for expediency. I'm going to use the word expediency a lot because I can't think of any other word uh, that describes what I'm doing. Okay. Now I hit. There's some depositional residue so I can kind of know where that hit. And if I'm in the right area for the next strike, I just hope there's no incipient cracks right now. Okay, so that did do what I wanted, but it shattered a lot of the edge. Yeah, it shattered a lot of it. And some of it happened on the first strike, and some of it happened on the second strike. And there's a lot of luck involved in where that flake went. Okay, the flake could have gone this way or that way a little bit. Luckily, and literally, luckily, it went into this area. Okay, so at this point in my brain, I can, I can say this is ready for indirect percussion because it's thin enough. I don't need to remove any big, bold, large flakes. I can continue with direct percussion if I want to. But I run the risk of this kind of thing, uh, for one. For two, it, it messes with the wrist because you have to stop the... I have to stop the, the flaker. That's one thing. The other thing is it's just the general shock. Um, so it's hard on the wrist. It's easier to, to complete this with indirect percussion physically. But I'm going to do one more strike here. I can do lighter than usual strikes, but see that that's uh, something I forgot too. See how it broke within the fractures there instead of breaking along the edge. 
This is a non-conchoidal type fracture because it combines two different types of fractures. One, the incipient cracks, and two, the uh, conchoidal uh, characteristics. It combines the two. So you don't really see a proper platform or what they would consider a proper platform on this flake. It's hard to see where it was removed. Although you know that from this, uh, this wave here that it probably originated on this side and not on some other side, okay? But yeah, this is, uh, now indirect percussion, could it have avoided this situation with indirect percussion? Maybe, because you're, you're focusing the shock in one specific area, so it may have been better than to try to slam the flaker into the edge to try to remove a flake when there's a lot of incipient cracks. But, you know, it's part of luck. Luckily, it's not too bad. Now, luck plays a part. Luckily, it's not too bad. I can live with it because I know I'm going to have to reduce it anyway. But yeah, it's probably more advantageous that I switch over to indirect percussion. Now, if you don't use indirect percussion, you can switch over to a smaller billet. Let's see. I do have a smaller aluminum billet. I can, I can start reducing, you know, I can start hitting with a smaller billet. on the slide, but I, I find this technique is a little bit redundant. You know, uh, why would I use this when I can just lightly tap with this? I can lightly tap with this big one and achieve the same result. To the little corner, I can gouge with this one. This one's more versatile. You can always tone down your hits and use a bigger flaker. Yeah. And a lot of guys in the beginning, when I, when I first started napping, a lot, most guys started with a big bopper, showed big boppers on videos because it's more versatile. You can just, you can take little flakes with a big bopper or big old flakes. I think that's why they like to use it. Um, and that sort of thing. So you can go ahead and use boppers only to get this down to where you just need to pressure flake it and that's it. But I like to use indirect percussion as an intermediate step. Intermediate step. So in my mind, the next phase of this is a totally different mindset. So I would either put this aside for later and do a bunch while I'm in the mindset or take a sigh of or take a breather and change my mindset that now it's it's going to be delicate this is more delicate work than what I was doing before it's a different mindset All right. so yeah let's see I'm just going to start trimming no reason just start trimming for expediency Regularizing. If you're in doubt, you don't know what to do, just regularize it while you're trying to figure out where the trouble, spot, trouble spots are. I always tend to tackle the tough spots first, especially on the ends. I thin the ends down first. End, end. Proximal, distal. I just saw some archaeology videos. Uh, so I'm refamiliarizing myself with the terminology periodically so I don't mess it up and if there's some people from that from that side of the aisle looking at these videos they can feel comfortable that I'm I recognize what their terminology is and I'm aware of their lingo okay so I'm removing you know lumpy areas along the edge regularizing the edge to make it a little bit straighter and stronger 
taking away delicate areas because I'm not going to be able to, not going to be able to flake off of the delicate areas except for the small flakes you can always do small flakes no matter what even on delicate areas I'm removing the delicate areas so I can make big flakes because I still need big flakes to flatten this out to thin it out especially on this side I remove a lot of the problems on this side but now I still have bulk on this side okay so I'm in the process of thinning this thinning that and then I'll tackle the middle okay on the next video